war had been ravaging the East since 1937 and Japan's invasion of China. It reached Europe on the 1st of September 1939 with Germany's invasion of Poland. It became global on the 7th of December 1941 when Japanese aircraft attacked the American naval base at Pearl Harbor. It touched every continent and lasted for six years. It cost more than four trillion dollars in today's values and took the lives of millions of men, women and children. It ended with a new weapon for a new age. The Second World War was the greatest of all man-made events. And these men are part of its history. They are eyewitnesses to the triumphs and tragedies of the war wherever it was fought. Their testimony is an element in the story of how our world was made. By those who could pay, and those who could no longer meet. The price of empire. In a world made unstable by issues of the First World War, unresolved by the peace treaty which ended that struggle, Dictators rose, and their ambitions brought Europe once more to the brink of conflict. In the second episode of The Price of Empire, Europe crashed over the brink when an unlikely alliance between Germany and the Soviet Union made each bold enough to move on Poland. It is now the early spring of 1940. Six months have passed with little action, the phony war. That is about to end, and a new word is to be added to the vocabulary of warfare, Blitzkrieg. On January the 10th, 1940, a German military aircraft made a forced landing at mechelen sur meurs in Belgium. Aboard was Major Helmut Reinberger, a staff officer of the 7th Airborne Division. In his possession was a complete copy of Vorgelb, case or plan yellow, the German plan for the invasion of Western Europe. The loss of this document to the enemy was, according to the German chief of operations, catastrophic. Hitler was forced to postpone his invasion until the spring, much to the relief of his high command, which had been arguing for a halt to allow for repair, rest and re-equipment. That delay was the phony war. Plan Yellow being compromised now presented General Erich von Manstein with the opportunity to press again his invasion strategy, which had earlier been rejected. Plan Yellow was little more than a rehashing of the offensive plan with which Germany had gone to war in 1914. Essentially, an attack across the Belgian border outflanking France's defensive preparations. It was the strategy that the Allies expected. The dreadful losses of the First World War, four and a half million French casualties, almost one and a half million dead, had persuaded France that the future of war lay with the entrenched soldier and the machine gun. Between the wars, France had spent vast amounts of money on preparing a defensive posture. Most of the money, perhaps three billion French francs, had gone on a fortified installation named for the Minister for War who had initiated it, André Maginot. The Maginot Line fortified the border between France and Germany. It was equipped with an underground railway, underground cinemas, and a garrison of half a million soldiers ready to repel any direct German assault. 
This supposedly impregnable position would, or so it was argued, oblige Germany to attack through Belgium along the lines of the 1914 offensive. And so it was here, from late 1939, that the French and British concentrated their forces. Had Plan Yellow, the attack across the Belgian border, been implemented, the outcome is unknowable. It would surely have been a tighter struggle than the demolition job that lay ahead. With Plan Yellow shelved following the plane crash in mechelen sur meuse the German High Command was forced to consider an alternative strategy. This was the moment for Erich von Manstein, a professional soldier in the Prussian tradition. By mid-February, Hitler had accepted von Manstein's plan, which has come to be known as the Sickelschnitt, or Sickle Cut. Earlier German plans had proposed a right hook swinging around against the channel ports. The Sickle Cut was to be a left hook swinging up behind the Allied armies waiting for their enemy to pour across the Belgian border. That left hook would be delivered by the new concept of massed armor. Walter Wenck, chief of operations of the 1st Panzer Division, coined the expression that best explains the thinking behind German as opposed to Allied armored tactics. Hit with your fist, Wenck said. Don't feel with your fingers. German armor would be the clenched fist, not the splayed fingers of Allied tactics, and it would race for territory, not stop for a set-piece battle. Von Manstein planned to exploit the weak point that was the key to the whole undoing of France, the gap between the defense of the Belgian border and the Maginot Line. That gap was the forest of the Ardennes, the point which German military theorists called the Schwerpunkt, the focal point or center of gravity. For von Manstein, the Schwerpunkt was the River Meuse between Sedan and Dinan. According to French planners, no attack could be pressed through the thick forest of the Ardennes, but according to the Manstein plan, armor could move through the forest and then, undetected, burst into the rear of the Allied lines as they faced the frontal attack being pressed, not just through Belgium, but also the Netherlands, whose sovereignty the Kaiser had respected 25 years earlier. Belgium and France were involved in the First World War, but the Netherlands was neutral, and I suppose it will be all right. Everybody was hoping that things would not turn for the worse. Hitler gambled. He ordered that all of the stockpiled materials and munitions of war be expended. The idea was that they would be replenished from the conquered lands. At the commencement of the invasion, the Luftwaffe, for example, had enough bombs for only 14 days of combat. The Germans were, in every particular, seriously outnumbered. They had three army groups comprising 133 divisions. The Allies facing them had 145 divisions, 3.7 million men to Germany's 2.7 million. And on paper, at least, France on her own was superior in tanks and aircraft. Speaking in August 1941, Hitler is reported to have said, I never use the word Blitzkrieg because it is a very silly word. But it is a word meaning literally lightning war, which has become stuck limpet-like to the idea of Germany's mechanized offensives the most devastating of which began at 05.45 hours on the morning of May the 10th, 1940. In less than six weeks, in as catastrophic and humiliating a military defeat as can be imagined, the battle would be over, and all the countries of continental Europe that had neither allied with Germany nor managed to preserve their neutrality would be under Nazi control.
The plan that the German High Command, the Oberkommando des Heeres, or OKH, had for the invasion of Western Europe forecast the defeat of France and the Low Countries and the isolation of Great Britain. But that was the extent of German planning in the West. There was no plan for the exploitation of conquered territory. For that sort of vision, we must turn our eyes, as Hitler did, to the East, where German plans were very different. It was only to secure the German rear, preparatory to initiating the plan for the East, the Generalplan Ost, that Hitler bothered with countries on his western borders. Once Western Europe was under his heel, Hitler would turn to realize his great vision of an empire in the East. So it was to secure the German rear that Hitler launched the Manstein Plan, a fearful demonstration of what war had become. General George Marshall, US President Franklin D. Roosevelt's chief of staff, saw as early as 1940 that the flag-waving days of warfare are gone. Nikolai Voznesensky, chief of the Soviet State Planning Commission, warned of a war of engines, a war that is won not on the battlefield but in the factories. It would not be flag-waving or glinting sabers or scarlet tunics, but bombs and shells and advancing armor that decided the issue, and most critically, not their possession, but their replenishment. The strength of a German Panzer Division by March 1945 would amount to 54 tanks. But in May 1940, a panzer division comprised 328 tanks, and there was everything to play for. The German onslaught began with bombs as the Luftwaffe attacked Allied airfields. German airborne troops parachuted into the Netherlands to seize vital bridges. In Belgium, the supposedly impregnable fortress of Eben Emael, key to Liège, fell to gliderborne troops who overcame its defenses by the simple stratagem of landing on its roof. Units of von Bock's Army Group B crossed the Dutch and Belgian borders, luring the Allies into taking the bait. The Allied commander, French General Gamelin obliged, moving three French armies and the entire British expeditionary force, 40 divisions in total, north to face the anticipated invasion through Belgium. But the real threat was from Army Group A in the centre. Its seven panzer divisions with 1,800 tanks smashed through the Ardennes. A part of German military philosophy was Auftragstaktik, or mission tactics, which encouraged and expected initiative from commanders flexibly meeting local conditions. When the Blitzkrieg burst onto the French and British defences, it was the initiative of generals like Heinz Guderian and Erwin Rommel, whose growing reputation would be later confirmed in the desert battles of North Africa that drove their forces across country as they defied the attempts of their superiors to rein them in. In the evening of what was day one of the invasion, the British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain resigned from office. Cabinet Minister Leo Amory said of Chamberlain that he loathed war so passionately that he was determined to wage as little of it as possible. Chamberlain was replaced by Winston Churchill, who did not loathe war. Having served in the First World War and taken part in the last great British cavalry charge at Omdurman in the Sudan late in the 19th century, in May 1940, 
Winston Churchill was 65 years old, only five years younger than the man he replaced. The man to beat Hitler is Winston Churchill. Among his colleagues, Mr. Chamberlain, whose vocation of office was accomplished in a manner worthy of his great sincerity, remains as Churchill's right hand. Two days after Churchill took office on May 12th, the leading German units crossed into France, securing the north bank of the Meuse. On the 13th, the Dutch army was ordered to fall back for a last stand on the line Amsterdam-Rotterdam-Utrecht, but the war was lost in the Netherlands and on the same day, Queen Wilhelmina and her government evacuated to London. On the 10th of May, Germany attacked Denmark, Norway, Holland, Belgium and France all on the same day. On the fifth day, the German Air Force bombed Rotterdam. A lot of damage was done. I'm not aware how many people died, but I'm sure people died. And on that day, the Dutch High Command surrendered. So now we were occupied. The first couple of days in the occupation, quite a few huge families committed suicide. How many, I don't know, but the rumor came through Amsterdam. This family, that family. The relentless German assault was now pressing the Allies all along the front. The Netherlands was out of the war, armor from army groups A and B was moving against the French 9th Army, which disintegrated. The German 12th and 16th Armies, having crossed the Meuse, were threatening the rear of the Allied position. In Paris, they tried an appeal to the Almighty. In their hour of anxiety, French people hear the summons to prayer. At Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris, a solemn service of intercession is held. The Prime Minister, Monsieur Renault, attends, and Monsieur Daladier with the American ambassador. On the day that the Netherlands surrendered, the French Prime Minister had telephoned his British counterpart. We have been defeated, Paul Renault said. We are beaten, we have lost the battle. Churchill could only answer, surely it can't have happened so soon. But it had. In his telephone call to Churchill, Renault was reacting to news from the battlefield that if any one action can be said to have been responsible, sealed the fate of France the battlefield at Sedan. On September the 1st, 1870, a Prussian force had destroyed the French army at Sedan, forcing the abdication of the emperor and advancing the cause of German unification under Prussian stewardship. This historical resonance added something to the significance of a battle now being fought over the same ground. On the 16th of May, the Allies began to withdraw from Belgium. On the 17th, the fighting at Sedan ended with a German victory. In seven days, the Germans had advanced 320 kilometers, crossed the Meuse, and broken into the undefended Allied rear. On the seventh day of the invasion, Brussels, the Belgian capital, fell. German tanks were reported to be refueling at local petrol stations. German troops were seen milking cows abandoned in the fields. In close support of the tanks and the following infantry were the artillery and the Luftwaffe. The German Air Force had been designed to support action on the ground. Its later shortcomings can be traced to this priority, but in the invasion of France, they were not shortcomings. German fighters dominated the skies and both military and civilians feared nothing so much as the shrieking approach of the Junkers 87, the Stuka, short for Sturzkampfflugzeug, dive bomber, equipped with a mischievously terrifying device that the Germans called the Jericho Trumpet. The Jericho Trumpet, 
a propeller-driven siren tube that made the approaching aircraft with its banshee howl as menacing as some fantastical beast. We got off at Calais and I thought, God, oh, what's going on here? And the restaurant on the quayside, the windows are all broken. And I was rather puzzled, you know, it still didn't, still didn't click. All of a sudden, the planes came over, and they came screaming down. The scream of bombs coming down, and these stukas driving made a horrible screaming noise. And we dashed amongst the sand dunes, clawed at the earth, trying to get underground. You just, the fear is just overpowering. And I knew then, that was war. On May the 19th, Gamelan was replaced as Allied commander by General Vagon, but it was too late. The 7th Panzer Division under Rommel had reached Cambrai on the 18th and on the 20th. German armor reached the English Channel and the mouth of the River Somme, where so much blood had been spilt in the First World War. This thrust effectively split the Allied armies in two. The Allies attempted a counter-attack, but where the Germans massed their 2,700 tanks, the Allies still thought of the tank as an infantry support weapon and had their 3,000 machines widely dispersed along the entire front. Britain and French counter-offensives were also poorly coordinated, and the disruption to the German advance was momentary. Following the blunted Allied counterattack, the Germans turned north, pressing for the prize that had evaded the Kaiser's troops 25 years earlier, the Channel Ports. Boulogne fell on the 25th and Calais bitterly defended by the British on the 27th. Before then, an order which has puzzled many ever since changed the character of the battle. On May the 24th, Army Groups A and B linked up and Group van Kleist stopped less than 25 kilometers from Dunkirk, where it was opposed by a single low-grade French division and a weak British infantry force. And then, in one of war's regular and somewhat inexplicable turning points, it was ordered to halt. The day following the halt order, Hitler visited Army Group A's headquarters and he confirmed von Rundstedt's decision. We question the decision because with hindsight, we can see how feeble French resistance was beyond this point and how cheaply French capitulation was sold. For Hitler and his generals, the bulk of France's armed forces was yet to be conquered and after two hard weeks of fighting, Many of Germany's armored units had been reduced to 30% of their tank strength. Surely a pause to reform and re-equip would be prudent. They could not have known that prudence was not required. On May the 25th, the day after Hitler's visit to the front, Lord Gort, commanding the British Expeditionary Force, was advised by the Belgians commanded by King Leopold that their situation was desperate. Gort decided that his duty lay in saving his army to fight another day, rather than seeing it sacrificed for a lost cause. He began to withdraw his forces on Dunkirk, and the following day, May the 26th, almost 28,000 men not central to the BEF's fighting capacity were evacuated. The road from Boulogne was just full of moving bodies. That's all, that's all I can call them. Because they, they didn't look like people. They were men, women and children with bags, dragging little trucks. The children weren't talking or playing. All with vacant, vacant expressions, just looking straight ahead. Going nowhere. Reichsmarschall Hermann Göring, commanding the German Air Force, rejoiced that the kill of the troops trapped at Dunkirk would be left to his Luftwaffe. But the Luftwaffe could not do the job. The bombers could not find their targets at night and the fighters could not operate effectively.
It took one more miracle for the troops at Dunkirk to be saved. The notorious English Channel was, for the duration of the operation, a calm sea. On the 26th of May, the halt order was rescinded, but it was too late. An armada had been organized, an effective defense perimeter had been established, and 330,000 Allied troops were assembled at Dunkirk to be evacuated. There were 222 Royal Navy and approximately 860 civilian vessels at Dunkirk. Instead of the 45,000 hoped for, the fleet took off 338,000 Allied troops. On the way down to the harbour, they were shelling us, and I dropped into the gutter a couple of times. The harbour was full of sunken ships, and at the quayside, I could see somebody running in front of me. I could see him running, and he was running, and I thought, oh, that ship's got smoke coming out of the funnel, so I ran like mad as well, and it was just pulling away from the quayside, and I managed to get aboard. Forty percent of those evacuated from Dunkirk, 170,000 men, were French troops. They were returned to their own shores in southwestern France to carry on the fight. Following France's capitulation, they were out of the war. Dunkirk had saved the bulk of the British expeditionary force, but that army had been effectively disarmed. It left behind 64,000 vehicles and 2,500 guns. Those evacuated were, to all intents and purposes, beaten. But they were not defeated, and they were not pursued. When I first joined up, uh, my training was pretty much the same as uh, the 1914-18 war. Uh, the Enfield rifle was a big 18-inch long bayonet. And uh, jumping in and out of trenches, charging at bundles of twigs or sacks of straw and stabbing them. And, of course, it wasn't until uh, Dunkirk, at the time of Dunkirk, where we learnt that uh, there's another way of fighting, which was the Blitzkrieg. And that was taught to us by the Germans. The evacuation continued until June the 4th when the Germans entered Dunkirk. The following day, they resumed their offensive, pushing south into France. By the 9th, the French had been driven from the Somme. The outcome was hardly in doubt. And on the 10th, scenting victory, Mussolini declared war on Britain and France and the French government removed itself from Paris. Mussolini's caution is understandable. His army was both smaller and less well-equipped than it had been in 1915. On the 11th of June, Paris was declared an open city in the hope that this would save it from bombing and destruction. On June the 14th, General Bogislav von Studnitz led the 87th Infantry Division of the Wehrmacht through the almost deserted streets of the French capital. The next day, June the 15th, 400,000 Frenchmen of the surrounded 3rd, 5th and 8th Armies surrendered en masse. Whilst on the other side of Europe, in an opportunistic move, the Soviet Union expanded its empire by liquidating Latvia, Lithuania and Estonia as independent nations. On June the 17th, the 86-year-old Marshal Pétain, the hero of Verdun in the First World War, whose recall to Paris from his post as ambassador to Spain had been greeted by cheering crowds, announced that he had taken over as head of state and was seeking an armistice. The panic in his country that this announcement must have been calculated to quell is best illustrated by the eight million French people who had abandoned their homes since the invasion began. It was seeing some of these civilians on the road being strafed by a German fighter aircraft that led a British airman to say, so they are shits after all.
The Dutch and Belgian governments, though the Belgian king remained in his country, went into exile and many urged the French to do the same, perhaps relocating to French colonies in North Africa and continuing the fight from there. But the government of Marshal Pétain chose instead to surrender. An editorial in O Comercio do Porto, a newspaper in the Portugal of dictator Antonio Salazar, declared that the war is a sorry advertisement for democracy. As the military disaster was unfolding, there was talk in England of relocating the British royal family to Canada. A faction in the British cabinet led by Lord Halifax, the foreign secretary, who had been favored by both Chamberlain and the king to become prime minister, proposed putting out peace feelers using Mussolini as an intermediary. But Halifax had declined the top job, and the man who had been handed what many thought was a poisoned chalice was having none of it. Winston Churchill began at once to mobilize the weapon that he would use to such great effect throughout the war, the English language. That heartening broadcast of Mr. Winston Churchill's was a tonic to all who heard it. We tried again and again to prevent this war. And for the sake of peace, we put up with a lot of things happening which ought not to have happened. But now we are at war, and we are going to make war, and persevere in making war until the other side have had enough of it. If Churchill sounds different to the voice familiar from the stirring speeches delivered as prime minister, it is because the Prime Minister did not have time to travel to Broadcasting House and record for the nation the speeches he made in the House of Commons, which was not wired for sound. So an actor named Norman Shelley, the voice of Larry the Lamb on the BBC's Children's Hour, was the voice of Winston Churchill for several radio broadcasts. On the 18th of June, Marshal Pétain replaced Renault as Prime Minister. It was the day that Churchill made the speech in the Commons in which he swore that if the British Empire and its Commonwealth last a thousand years, men will say this was their finest hour. It was not France's finest hour. That same day, Charles de Gaulle broadcast from London. He told the French people, this war has not been settled by the Battle of France. This is a world war. We believe that the honor of the French depends on continuing the war at the side of our allies. I was at La Francis Guerre on board a big ship. We left, we left France in June 1940 when France collapsed. And I went to England. And then I heard that de Gaulle was carrying the war beside the British. We went out to find out what was the goal, which, because it was just general, but nobody knew who he was. After a few days of inquiry, we, uh, we decided to run the goal. I ran the goal on the 13th of July, 1940. On the day that de Gaulle made his appeal, Churchill said in his finest hour speech, the Battle of France is over. I expect that the Battle of Britain is about to begin. In one of history's strange ironies, these speeches were made on the day that marked the 125th anniversary of the Battle of Waterloo, when Britain, with her German allies, had defeated the French under Napoleon. On June the 17th, Britain had suffered its worst ever maritime disaster, about three times worse than the Titanic. The Cunada Lancastria, carrying between six and 9,000 evacuees, troops and civilians who had been left in France after the Dunkirk operation, had been sunk by German aircraft. Only 2,500 were saved. Churchill imposed a news blackout on the event. He felt that the British people were receiving quite enough bad news. On June the 20th, Lyon fell and a general ceasefire was declared in France. More than one and a half million French troops became German prisoners. When Charles de Gaulle called for continued resistance, 
General Vegan, his commander-in-chief, said nonsense. He said, in three weeks, England will have her neck wrung like a chicken. Some chicken, Churchill was later famously to remark. Some neck. France's formal surrender was signed on June the 22nd. France, if not quite all of the French, was out of the war. The Kaiser, who had abdicated at the very end of the First World War, telegrammed Hitler from his exile in the Netherlands. My Führer, he wrote, I congratulate you and hope that under your marvelous leadership, the German monarchy will be restored completely. Hitler turned to his valet. What an idiot, he said. The Blitzkrieg was a military disaster, but not a military defeat. The French armed forces were still in the field when the government capitulated, and after the armistice, 1,700 of France's frontline aircraft were found distributed amongst airfields in the unoccupied zone. They had never flown against the Germans. The fall of France was the result not of her defeat, but of her surrender. The Vichy regime that became the government of France, Vichy is the small spa town in which it was located, stands shoulder to shoulder with the most controversial topics of the Second World War. Was Marshal Philippe Pétain the shield of France, who had saved his country from the humiliation of total defeat, or was he happy to reach an early accommodation with, was he sympathetic with, Hitler's ideology? In 1934, as the dictators were starting to rise, the French newspaper Le Petit Journal ran a poll. France endured 42 weak governments between the wars, and the poll asked, who should take over as dictator? Philippe Pétain was the popular pick with 200,000 votes. Second was Pierre Laval, who would become Vichy's prime minister. He received 31,000. When Pétain formed his government, he effectively abolished the Republic. He got rid of the motto that had served since the revolution, liberty, equality, brotherhood, and replaced it with travail, famille, patrie, work, family, fatherland. France would now, Pétain said, be a new society, rejecting the false idea of the equality of men. The armistice that Pétain agreed to accepted German occupation of three-fifths of France, the industrial heartland, the border region with Germany, and the whole of the Atlantic and Channel coastline. The Vichy government nominally ruled over the country, but in reality, exercised complete sovereignty only over the so-called zone libre, the free zone. Pétain also agreed to pay the full costs of the occupation, which were grossly overstated by the Germans. France overall is estimated to have contributed 42% of the Reich's external aid through the war. Supply from French farms and factories, supply of French labor to German factories, acquisition of French military hardware, and the continued detention in Germany of one and a half million French prisoners of war were all part of a very one-sided armistice. France was allowed to keep her overseas empire and her navy, and it was the French fleet that caused the greatest immediate concern to the British government. It sought reassurance that the fleet would not be allowed to fall into Axis hands. Receiving no such assurance, the Royal Navy blockaded the fleet at its North African bases in Mers el Kabir and Oran. On July the 3rd, Admiral James Somerville communicated his terms to the French Admiral Marcel Bruno Jansoun. It is impossible for us, your comrades up to now, to allow your fine ships to fall into the power of the German enemy, he wrote. His Majesty's government have instructed me to demand 
that the French fleet shall act in accordance with one of the following alternatives. And he listed, joining him, scuttling the fleet, or sailing away with reduced crews to some French port in the West Indies where they can be demilitarized to our satisfaction or perhaps be entrusted to the United States. Failing the above, I have orders from His Majesty's government to use whatever force may be necessary to prevent your ships from falling into German hands. But Admiral Jean Soult would not comply. Somerville opened fire. The first engagement between British and French forces since Waterloo resulted in the deaths of 1,297 French servicemen the sinking of a battleship, damage to five other ships, and to the Anglo-French relationship. Britain was now alone, but at least thanks to Dunkirk, she still had some sort of an army. Importantly, in terms of recognizing that the war was far from over, it should be remembered that the British Expeditionary Force represented a small proportion of the forces available to Britain from within a reasonably unified empire. An empire that was mobilizing to her aid as it had done a generation earlier. Those in the Dominions would again demonstrate their readiness to pay the price of empire. It wasn't until uh, May and June 1940 we learned that Britain really had her backs to the wall and looked like being invaded by the Nazis. So there was a, an outpouring of patriotic fervours up and down Australia and fellas by the thousand, literally by the thousand, were rushing to join up so to go and help Britain. But the price of empire is not evenly shared. Amongst French troops left to fall into German hands were thousands from France's African possessions. About 10,000 were killed in the fighting, and among those taken prisoner, it is estimated that as many as 3,000 were shot out of hand in a racially motivated crime. Following the evacuation from Dunkirk and the fall of France, orders were given in Britain that the church bells which pealed every Sunday were not to be rung again except to signal an invasion. And an invasion of the British Isles by a rampant Germany was everyone's expectation. After all, considered numerically, the troops restored to British soil meant that if the Wehrmacht invaded, they would face weaker opposition than they had brushed aside in Belgium and the Netherlands. Instead of an invasion, in mid-July, the Luftwaffe dropped leaflets over England. They were titled, A Last Appeal to Reason. On July the 19th, Hitler said, I feel it is my duty before my own conscience to appeal once more to reason and common sense in Great Britain. The controversy over whether the peace overtures to Britain were sincere, whether peace would have been possible, persists. To the moment of his death, Adolf Hitler would talk about the war that was forced on me and describe Winston Churchill as a warmonger. Hello. Good luck to you all. Keep it up. It's going well. You're all playing a part. When Churchill became prime minister, his country was already at war, and the evidence of the cruel and destructive ambitions of Hitler was overwhelming. Peace may have been possible, but it strains credibility to suppose that it could have been a lasting peace or a peace in which the United Kingdom would have been better treated than France, obliged to allow occupation stripped of her military strength and forced to pay a sum equivalent to 50 times the actual cost of the occupation. Churchill wanted no part of it. He told the British people in the first of his landmark speeches, we shall go on to the end. 
He told them, we shall fight on the sea and oceans. He said, we shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. He promised, we shall never surrender. And he meant it. Which is why at this exact time on July the 18th, the day before Hitler's conciliatory statement, Churchill closed the Burma Road. Although the conflicts of East and West were yet to merge into one great affair, this was already a world war. Burma was part of the British Empire. It had been made so by Churchill's father, Lord Randolph Churchill. And the road, which was never more than a precarious single track along which trucks lumbered slowly, carried up to 30,000 tonnes of supplies a day to support China's fight against Japan. On the 18th of July, 1940, Churchill, the great enemy of appeasement, yielded to Japanese pressure and closed the Burma Road. He later defended his action by saying that leaving the road open would have meant something dangerous might have happened. Something dangerous would have been Japan taking matters into its own hands, moving against Burma and forcing Britain into a war on two fronts. But appeasing Japan did not prevent danger. On the day that Churchill closed the Burma Road, the military party in Japan triumphed, and General Hideki Tojo, who would later achieve notoriety as wartime prime minister, became minister for war. A few days later, Japan announced its aim of creating a Greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere. In September 1940, Japan occupied Indochina and signed a tripartite pact with Rome and Berlin. The threat to Britain's empire in the East was becoming palpably real. The price of empire was going up. Hitler was a great admirer of the British Empire. In Mein Kampf, he made clear his admiration for the British Empire and Lives of a Bengal Lancer was his favorite film. What India was for England, Adolf Hitler would say before launching the invasion of the Soviet Union, the territories of Russia will be for us. He believed that the two empires could coexist and on August the 14th, the day after the Battle of Britain began, told the 12 generals that he had raised to field marshal that Germany would not benefit from defeating Great Britain. The beneficiaries of that, Hitler said, would be Japan in Asia, Russia in India, Italy in the Mediterranean, and the United States in world trade. That, Hitler said, is why peace is possible with Britain. But it was not. In the next episode of The Price of Empire, the only opposition to Hitler and the Third Reich is the United Kingdom and her empire. Germany begins assembling a fleet for the cross-channel invasion and launches an air war. Battle of Britain to gain aerial superiority and to weaken civilian morale. It was the time when the darkest hour became the finest hour.